welcome to We Got Planning News for You. Thank you all very much for joining us. Um, we first of all kind of remind viewers that um, we encourage you all to donate either to a charity of your choice or to one of our three um, preferred charities, Save Me, Brian May's Wildlife Charity, Shelter, um, the Homelessness and Housing Charity, or the Ukraine GoFundMe page. We're delighted to, to welcome uh, today um, Helen Fadipe, the um, chair and founder of the BAME Planets Network. Helen, thank you so much indeed for joining us. We're really looking forward to our discussion with you in the second half of the show. Um, the usual question, can you tell us um, where you're calling from, uh, what theme you've chosen for us this week, and, and what, if anything, you're drinking this evening? Okay, hi, right. thanks Charlie, and thanks to the team for inviting me. I'm calling in from Birmingham. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it well. Hey, Great to see you well. Yes. And um, I'm here for the National Planning Conference, and I'm speaking from my hotel room. And um, my theme for the day is gratitude. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Well, we uh, look forward to to hearing more um, thoughts from you later on in, in the show. And as I say to all the guests, and particularly as given your your thirty year career in planning, if you've got anything you'd like to add to any of the case reports, no obligation, of course. We'd be delighted to know any thoughts you may have. Um, now, let's introduce our, the usual panel. Mary, um, I know where you are. You're going to tell us where you are. Uh, Good what, evening, what, Charlie. What, what contribution to the theme. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I am speaking to you all from the Harbour Hotel in Southampton. I hope it's not too noisy, um, but it's a, a joy to be here. I've literally been here for about two minutes, so I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. Lovely to see you, Helen. Hope you're having a good time in Birmingham. So Mary Cook from Town Legal. And my theme in terms of gratitude is um, I've saved my copy. I'm an army brat. My <laughs> grandfather and my grandfather on my paternal side were in the forces. So I'm showing my gratitude and also to the staff here for bringing me a, a glass oh, of pale awesome. ale. Amazing. Fantastic. Thanks, Mary. Sasha, should you not be upside down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should. I should. It is an unearthly hour in New Zealand <laughs> and I am, yeah, I'm still celebrating Sunday night, England's win, two trophies in three years in the ICC World Cup. So <laughs> it was very enjoyable watching them win on Sunday and on Thursday. So, um, yeah, and my gratitude is obviously for that result. Fantastic, Sasha. Chris, how are you doing? Looking very I'm smart. very well. I'm very well, Charlie. I'm in London. Uh, you're in Birmingham, Helen, and I should be in Birmingham. And instead, I'm in London. And you're from London. So um, I am here for the Nipper dinner this evening. And for the theme, I have got some Quality Street. Thank you very much. I've also got uh, a drink. I don't see that. Hot shots. Because you know what? I'm just delighted to always be in the company every fortnight of you hot shots, if I may say so. Um, and uh, Helen as well. And then finally, I don't know if Rob's got a photograph uh, that I sent him earlier, but um, I am particularly grateful for these people. Mm. They are the ambulance staff of the West Midlands Ambulance Service who got my mother to hospital after she had a mini stroke yesterday. They got to her house in nine minutes. They got there in nine minutes. These people are brilliant. And we started this whole show supporting the NHS. So... Um, I'm showing my support for them now. Brilliant. Bravo, Chris. And the whole infrastructure community is going to be delighted that you're joining the dinner and looking forward to the first DCO founded on lack of five-year housing land supply. Um, housing one. <laughs> uh, Paul, uh, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, Charlie. Uh, and my gratitude is to my wife um, because I'm currently in a very nice hotel in Belfast, as you can see. Mm. I'm going to see uh, the comedian Tommy Turnin, Turnin this evening. Uh, I've just done a tour of Ireland. I've had a week off and it's fantastic, but it's an absolute joy to see you, Helen. So cheers. And to celebrate, I've got a bag of my favourite, Tato, which you can't get in England. Fantastic. <laughs> and it's not even a motorway service area hotel. Uh, not me, Darren. The really socialist cool. booked uh, it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's amazing. Well, Charlie Banner here. I'm in Chambers in London. Um, my drink is a cold coffee that I forgot to drink earlier. Um, I haven't had time to go and get a beer that I can murder one. I'm grateful that we haven't been nuked this week. I was a little bit worried on Monday evening, to be quite honest. Um, and grateful that we are in a, in a country which, for now at least, is at peace, uh, which is a little reminder. I think the imminent concerns that a lot of us might have had on Monday evening when we saw that 
Russia might bomb Poland, bring, triggering Article 5 of NATO. We realise just how um, how stressful it must be for those who actually are in countries that are experiencing war and uh, terrorism, etc. So I'm grateful that for now, at least, we don't have that in a significant degree. Anyway, on to the case reports. And I believe, Mary, you're going to kick us off with the CPRE case. I am indeed. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, and the issue here is whether the monitoring officer made a mistake in allowing those members who had in fact declared interests to participate in a planning committee decision. So this was a claim brought by CPRE, the local branch, challenging the grant of planning permission by South Somerset District Council on the application made by Ilminster Town Council for the erection of five self-contained buildings to store carnival floats. And as you can see, this is a decision uh, or by Mr. Justice Chamberlain and uh, Richard Mools appeared for the claimant and Annabel Graham Poole for the defendant. And at the heart of this uh, were these facts. The vice chair of the planning committee was the deputy mayor of, of the town council and uh, who, who, of course, was the applicant. And the chair of the planning committee was a member of the Chard Carnival Committee, in which capacity he had supported the proposal. Uh, and the uh, CPRE, CPRE raised the issue of personal interests with respect, in fact, to six members of the planning committee prior to the meeting. Three members stood aside and didn't participate. One declared a personal interest and voted against. But the two I've mentioned, the chair and the vice chair, declared their interests, but on the advice of the monitoring officer were able to participate and they voted in favour. And it was a very narrow vote. It was a 6-5 vote. Uh, and the court reviewed the law on bias, Porter and McGill, you will remember, uh, applying the fair-minded and informed observer test. They also looked at the issue of predetermination, uh, again, applying the red car and Cleveland test was there a real risk that mines were closed? The council tried to argue that one of the town councillors had played no part in the application process at the town council end and therefore was not personally involved and had no prejudicial interest. The court uh, took a dim view of that. The other uh, member, the chair of the planning committee, was in fact pictured in the local press holding up a leaflet at a local carnival stand um, and again, the court took the view that that gave a real um, gave rise to a real possibility of bias. So Mr. Justice Chamberlain had no difficulty in quashing that decision. But he was quite clear that no member and indeed no uh, planning officer had made any error. It was simply the monitoring office, officer's error in the advice given. And so that permission was quashed. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thanks, Mary. That's a salutary tale, um, indeed, and a uh, very interesting case. Now, um, next up, Chris, you're going to tell us about a Tesco um, case. Allardale. I am. I am indeed. It's good to know that the interpretation of planning policy as an argument in the High Court and elsewhere is alive and well and living in Cumbria. So um, this is the case which involves what I call store wars, where one supermarket chain goes against another uh, and keeps lawyers very, very busy. Um, I've worked for both of these uh, these clients. Um, and I have to say, we quite enjoyed on one occasion, with a bit of irony, noticing that Tesco had opened a store and Lidl had opened a store and Lidl wrote on their, on their roof, every Lidl helps. I've <laughs> so there's a good bit of there's a good bit of competition between them. Um, this one involved a little proposal that Tesco challenged, and uh, Richard Turney was acting on behalf of Tesco, uh, and he was challenging a grant of planning permission for a little store. And we can see our very own Sasha White um, was acting on behalf of Little. Um, just to help everybody where this little store was, it was in Workington up in Cumbria. I think we've got a map. This is just to help people from London. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's near to, it's near to the, the Lake District where some of you have your second homes. Uh, but um, there it is. Uh, it's a working town. And uh, I think we've got another photograph of the area we're concerned with because the, the issue concerned the Derwent, uh, River Derwent, which has its own policy 
And I love the description here. This kind of place me and Paul recognise. It says the site of Little's proposed store falls within the specified Lower Derwent Valley. Uh, from the west to the east, there's the Derwent Park, home of the Workington Town Rugby League Club and the Workington Comets Speedway team. Look at that. The Speedway track goes round and round the rugby pitch. I hope they don't play at the same time. Uh, then there's a Tesco Superstore. You can see that marked on there. Um, and then um, you've got the uh, the travel, the roundabout, the travel lodge, the Costa Coffee and the drive through. And on the other side, you've got the Workington Reds Football Club. So it's all going on uh, there in terms of the town's activities. And um, what happened was, in essence, there was an issue about the interpretation of a particular policy. Now, the policy we're concerned with was a policy specific to that valley, and it was uh, SA49 Lower Derwent Valley. I think we've got part of it there. And what it was doing really was saying, well, look, this is quite near to the town centre, so and there's a number of recreation activities, so we will support recreational activity and ancillary um, ancillary retail. So proposals for new replacement sport or leisure and ancillary main town centre uses will be supported. That would be consistent with the policy. And then it says two proposals will expect it to be. And that's three of a whole series of criteria. And part four of the policy is if it's a ma main town centre use, so not an ancillary main town centre use but an actual ancillary uh, an actual main town centre use which would be retail then it must meet the impact and sequential test so there was a big hoo-ha frankly about whether it fell within that particular policy criteria and um sasha white's interpretation was favored because what the court said um at paragraph 29 was i agree with mr white casey we always like to see that don't we when we read the judgment um, the paragraph two would apply to a proposal for a non-ancillary main town centre use as falling within the words proposal. And uh, it wasn't right to say that the, the little store was ancillary town centre use. It's very obviously a town centre use. And the main issue in the case wasn't so much the interpretation as how the officer's report should be read. Because for a careful reading of the report, the officer did not actually expressly say that the proposal conformed with the policy. What the officer dealt with was the objections that were raised by Tesco, looked at the policy, looked at how you could conform with it, but didn't reach the view that actually it was a, um, a misinterpretation of policy on the basis that the officer had assumed that it was um, an ancillary main town centre use. Now, there's a lot more to the interpretation of the case, but we've got limited time and we want to hear from Helen. But well done, Sasha. Uh, well done to the officers uh, who navigated this difficult <clears throat> issue, which has been a, an issue in that area on a number of occasions. And um, as it turned out, Tesco were unsuccessful and Little will get their store. Thank you, Charlie. Else. Thank you, Chris. Um, next up, Paul, can you take us to Billericay in Basildon District, Essex? Yeah, well, I, I had to look this up. Apparently, this is a real place, not somewhere from the uh, the pen of Gulliver's Travels. Uh, people do live in somewhere called Billericay, uh, I'm delighted to say. And uh, uh, this re relates to a, an appeal decision which took place, sorry, this uh, an inquiry which took place in September, an appeal decision which... Uh, was issued on uh, on Remembrance Day last Friday. So this is very much hot off the press. And this is really an unusual case because this involves a proposal for 47 homes on a full application in the Greenbelt, and the appeal was allowed. Uh, it was an appeal against non-determination by Inland Homes, uh, Giles Atkinson and Zach Simons crossing swords on, on this one. And the arguments were, well, firstly, there were two putative reasons for refusal from the councils, uh, the first of which related to it being inappropriate development in the green belt and the second of it being a uh, failure to contribute to a whole list of infrastructure requirements everything from um uh, securing job broker opportunities which i literally do not understand uh, but i'm sure is very big in billericay all the way to uh, education huge shopping list but that was all settled by the time of the inquiry so the inquiry turned upon whether or not uh, what was proposed comprised appropriate or inappropriate development in the Greenbelt. So when I first looked at this, I thought this would be a very special circumstances case, 
because this is an authority where they've withdrawn their emerging uh, local plan. So there's no real plan B as to how to meet their housing need, uh, but not a bit of it. The whole inquiry turned upon whether or not what was proposed was inappropriate development in the Greenbelt. Uh, Rob, if you can just put up the paragraph, if, if we can. There we go. So um, the conclusion from the inspector was that this was uh, uh, not inappropriate uh, development in the Greenbelt, uh, taking away the double negatives, appropriate development in the Greenbelt, um, because although there was a significant increase in the floor space of what was proposed by the 47 homes against what was essentially an equestrian centre, lots of single storey development in the curtil uh, with curtilages which comprise paddocks. So although there was a significant in uh, increase in footprint and also a significant increase in volume, I think it was 80% in footprint, 124% in volume, Nonetheless, the inspector grappled with the relevant paragraph, which is paragraph 149, subparagraph G of MPPF. Again, Rob, if you can just bring that up, please. And he concluded that uh, the test was not to cause substantial harm, as you can see from the second bullet point on paragraph 149G, not to cause substantial harm to the openness of the green belt, where you're dealing with the partial or complete redevelopment of PDL. And the inspector intimated that, that not causing substantial harm was a very high bar. That was the paragraph that we've just looked at and therefore concluded that, in fact, this was not inappropriate development in the Greenbelt. So 47 homes in the Greenbelt on a paddock in equestrian use, not inappropriate development in the Greenbelt. Um, the second issue related to impact on character and appearance. And in relation to that, the inspector found it was a very, very well enclosed uh, um, uh, uh, field. But that, that paragraph, 149G, um, is an interesting one because that's saying the threshold is not causing harm to the openness of the green belt. It's not causing substantial harm, and that's a net harm compared to the existing use. Uh, it's not saying it's it's open open fields uh, upon uh, uh, equestrian uses in peripheral locations adjacent to uh, rural towns, but it certainly at least makes those ones worth looking at uh, when it comes to either allocations uh, or development opportunities. So that, thank you, Charlie. An interesting case. Well done absolutely. to Zach in relation to that. A close thought by Giles. Absolutely, Paul. And uh, there was a two schools of thought, weren't there, initially, about whether that um, bullet point was only for 100% affordable housing schemes or those which would contribute towards identified needs. And this was a market-led scheme, wasn't it? So, Correct. So therefore, the if you like, the bar to, to get un to get underneath in order to be uh, appropriate development is 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 quite significant in that context so very important uh, agreed it's an important case absolutely now next up um we're going to go to um the uh, beautiful city of luton uh, and sasha is going to tell us about a case from there i am and i'm going to try in the light of what mary said to not show bias and predetermination on this appeal because i had the unfortunate occurrence of being at Wembley in 1988 when Luton beat Arsenal so I'll put aside my bitterness which has not reduced in 30 odd years um, but Chris spent the pleasure of being in Luton promoting a scheme which was for 132 flats uh, obviously student accommodation was the existing use and it sounds like the student accommodation Chris will recall from his site visit was had seen better days and this was a proposal for 132 flats in a pretty, pretty sustainable site. Indeed, one of the issues was that they overlooked the main bus station. So you couldn't get a more sustainable site. The main issues identified by the inspector were effectively four, compliance with the development plan, whether the proposal was an efficient use of land, whether um, it would have harm to the character and appearance of the area. And lastly, whether the proposal would have acceptable living conditions for those who would occupy the 132 flats. I think it's fair to say in the inspector's conclusions, it was pretty a comprehensive um, decision in favour of the appellants. As you can see, the appeal was allowed. And I think it's what the points I would really emphasise here effectively was, again, I mean, it, it, there's so often we see councils opposing the redevelopment of very, very sustainable town centre sites. And in here, clearly, the inspector concluded there would be efficient use of land, that there would be reuse of brownfield, and also there would be um, reuse of the vacant building. So very powerful benefits in exist in addition to effects on the vitality and viability of the town centre. 
And interestingly, I haven't seen this often, the passive surveillance of the bus station long term from the occupation of the 132 flats and the social benefits. So overall, those benefits and the conclusions the inspector reached on the four main issues amounted to compliance with the development plan. The the other slightly interesting point of this case was Luton, like a lot of authorities, published an incredibly glossy brochure, a corporate brochure calling itself the master plan. And there was an allegation of non-compliance with the elements of the master plan. I think the inspector's approach to the master plan is impeccable, basically concluding it wasn't part of the development plan and it wasn't subject to consultation, therefore the weight to be given to that document and alleged non-compliance must be very, very small. So I think a good decision for those of us who believe in the purity and the sanctity of the development plan. Um, And well done, Chris. Comprehensive win, quite clearly. Thank you, Charlie. Brilliant. Thanks, Sasha. Well, that concludes the case reports. And now on to our discussion with Helen. So um, welcome again, um, Helen. Uh, You're a strategic planner with 30 years experience in both public and private sectors. You've been Islington, Watford and Haringey um, councils, the latter as the deputy director in charge of planning and building control. Um, and you've had your own consultancy since 2005. And not only have you led major development schemes in the UK, such as Oak War for major redevelopment in Hackney, um, but also um, 6,000 dwellings in Buckinghamshire, but also in Lagos, uh, a model city plan for over 4 million people, um, proving that planning is international, something that I'm a personally very big advocate of. Uh, You've been a member of the RTPI General Assembly uh, for the last three years and been on various panels and committees at RTPI, uh, both before and after uh, that. You've won several planning awards and have judged various other RTPI planning awards. So quite spectacular. But um, you're here to talk us uh, talk with us principally about the Bain Planners Network, which you set up in August 2020 in the middle of the, the, the pandemic. Um, tell us, first of all, um, Helen, a little bit about um, who, what Bain and, and uh, Bain Planners Network do and, and what are your key objectives? OK, thank you very, very much to, um, for this platform to be able to talk about the Bain Planners Network and also to talk about diversity and inclusion within the planning profession. So I really, really appreciate um, what you are doing in terms of the um, legal aspect and the learning, but also in promoting a course like ours. So the Ben Planners Network was uh, officially launched in August 2020. And the main aim at the time was to promote a friendly platform. You know, um, I've mentioned um, in several outlets that just after George Floyd's death, um, mm-hmm. I got um, um, okay, um, I got a phone call from a young lady and she said, can I speak to you? I said, yes. And the young lady was distraught. Um, she's not seen anyone who looked like her in the profession and she didn't feel that the planning profession was for her. And she was very keen on leaving the profession. And I said, no, don't leave. Around the same time, someone else approached me about someone who's been trying for the past year or so, just trying to get a promotion. And I knew the pain that person was going through because I, you know, I was there in 2005. You know, I went for interviews as head of planning and I just wasn't getting in. And I thought to myself, if you can move up, then move out and do your own thing. And that is the story of many of, you know, um, of many people from the BAME, um, from the BAME communities. So fast forward to 2020, on the back of all those phone calls, you know, and several other things, I thought to myself, it's about time that we come together as a community to help mm-hmm. each other. And it was more as a friendly platform to support one another and to raise the profile that there were many BAME planners who were holding senior positions, who are doing well in the profession so that others can see them and aspire to those posts. So talking about what our aims are, um, the main thing is we've got um, raising the visibility of planners 
which um, you know, I'm proud to say we've done successfully. I mean, BME planners, because you know, planners um, are of you know are of um, many um, ethnicity and race. The second um, aim is to encourage more BMEs into the profession. And then we've also got an aim to help BMEs to progress in their career, either in the public sector or private sector. And um, we are also looking to enable and help local communities in terms of engaging with planning. Mm -hmm. And our fifth aim is to collaborate with other organizations to advance inclusion and diversity within the planning profession. So those are, so those are the five main aims. And um, just before I wrap up on this question is to also say that the organization isn't limited to just, to just those from BME background. We've got a lot of members who are non-BMEs and we've got members who are not planners. Mm. The key criteria is you must share the aims and objectives. So if you believe in what we are doing, then please feel free, join us. And so that's what it is. So, and it's not affiliated to any organization. Thanks, Helen. Well, I'll get my application in this evening. <laughs> Thank you. Um, tell us a little bit more. I mean, the, the objectives obviously are, um, are profound and, and wide ranging. So can you tell us a little bit more about what you've been doing since set being set up to promote those objectives? What sort of events, what other um, activities and ways of pursuing those objectives have you been engaging in? Okay, I'll start from the very first one, raising the visibility of planners. We've been able to have an event called S Together, where we invited planners who were very senior within the profession from BAME background. And, um, you know, and that raised the profile that we've got heads of planning, deputy directors, directors who are from the BMEs. So it doesn't, so it's not just all BMEs and not just senior planners. And if I may just step back a bit, is that one of the earlier comments we got from someone who worked, who is still working, works within London, is that in the 15 years they've been in planning, they've never met anyone who was above the position of a senior planner from the BME background. And that's reality. We had this in writing. It's not, mm. it's not someone telling me, someone said, this is something, someone, you know, this particular person. And the person works within a South London authority. And you would expect that in South London, we okay. would have senior planners. So we've been able to raise that profile. We've been able for the first time to nominate and get a BAME planner awarded a Queen's Honor. That's one key achievement that we've done. Thank you. And Ransford Stewart was, um, you know, he got his badge last week and he's been he awarded. His name. He his name. Ransford, Ransford Stewart, OBE. Uh, and Ransford, Ransford, yes, yes. So at least we were able as a network to put him forward and we supported it with Amazing. evidence to show what is achieved in his long career. So moving on quickly to the next um, aim, which is to, you know, bring more BMEs into the profession. This is one of the aims that we need to do more, more with, but we are collaborating with some organization in terms of um, being more representative and attending school fairs and talking to younger people so that when they see people who look like them, then they might be drawn into that profession. Definitely not more needs to be done, but we've started by having those dialogues and working collaboratively with this particular organization. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the third one, this is one of the key areas we've made the most achievements. We've had people, and this is about helping our members progress in their career. We've had lots of many of our members who were struggling to get into the next role. We've been able through coaching. So we offer interviewing prep. We help look at CV. We've had one of the major recruitment company 
um, help, you know, helping us with um, coaching 101. We've had, um, you know, some training from this company. I would, uh, I would mention them by name because they've really, really <coughs> been to us. And that is Gatembi and um, Gatembi Sanderson. So they are a senior recruitment company. And one of their directors is on our board. But she came on board to help us before we called her into the board. And they've really, really been so supportive. And so we've had uh, things like coaching, personal branding, and we are seeing our members moving to head of planning positions. People, someone who that's been, in, you know, been a planner for many, many years, working at a very senior level, but not being able to even move to a senior planner role. We've been able to break that barrier just by offering some, some support. We have a mentoring lounge, which we also do, and we also have a targeted program for those uh, finishing their course um, in um, at uni and those in the early years of their career. And so we also offer that support. And these are things that we do directly to support our members. We are, we are now working with planning portal, the RTPI, PINs and PASS, looking at ways we can increase diversity in procurement. And this is more targeted towards those who are consultants. Mm, mm. So we have a lot of BMEs who are, you know, who run small, pra uh, small practices or so practitioners. And we need to start to look at how we can help them, you know, you know, win parts of those contracts that's out there. And the final one is the collaboration. And um, I'm pleased to say that we've done that excellently well. We've got an MOU with the RTPI. We've, you know, we are working closely with um, PAS, PINs, helping them with their recruitment, with their EDI, uh, the C um, CPRE, um, ALBPO. We've, uh, we've met with them and talked to them and a host of other organizations. And, you know, I'll say that in the two years, it's been a marathon, to say the least. And I would like to give credit to the rest of the steering group members uh, and the and the comms teams. Without the support of the volunteers, we would not have achieved this much. And it's been it's really been a marathon, but we've achieved a lot in the two years. Thank you. That's fantastic, Helen. Well, um, you're, you're, the website is baimplanners.org, isn't it? We'll yes, make sure you put a link yes. on, on our YouTube channel to that. Maybe Rob can bring that on, up on screen for the recording. And can I encourage any individuals or organisations listening either now or, or later to, to get in touch if you haven't already? Do you have any particular ambitions or, or things lined up for 2023? Yes. Um, in 2023, we will... You know, we, we will continue to collaborate, especially on the issue of procurement. And, the, and, and we've also observed that there is a big divide between those who finish from universities, who graduate, and their ability to get that first job. And we need to understand why. You know, practically every day I'm getting emails, tests from, from young people, trying to get into planning. I'm getting messages from those who are coming from abroad, trying to get into planning. So that would be something that we are looking at how we can work better with the RTP and other organizations. How can we help people make them, that transition? We have, we have individuals who are keen to, be, to work within planning. And at the same time, planning is saying they are under-resourced. So how, how can we bring those two together? How can we? So that's something that, that we will be working on. And the last thing is um, we did this survey last year. It's taken us nearly one year to get the mm. final report out. So early in the new year, we will share the findings of that report. And we've shared the bits here and there with different organizations, but we will share with the wider public um, in the new year. So, so these are some of the things that we are looking at. How can we better engage with other organizations to offer the support that people with from different ethnic minority groups 
that they need. And so that's still core because that draws, you know, that is the biggest thing that, that we spend our time on is just offering that support to individuals. And if I may say so, many of whom may not know any other planner. Mm. So it's not as though they are coming into the, the country and they know a planner. You know, people approach us because they see us on LinkedIn and then they then, you know, send a test. I've just arrived from this country. I'm a planner. I was a director in my country. My wife moved there or my husband moved there. I'm trying to get a job in planning. How do I go about it? And that, I guess that's the power of the word network. Yes, in your title, yes. isn't it? it provides yes. people who may not have a network with one. Um, yes. You talked about some of the uh, some of the individual challenges and some of the sort of wider systemic challenges in the past, but also some success stories of how they've been um, addressed. So if you were to give a state of the nation type speech concerning where we are now with diversity in the planning sector, what would your headline points be? Okay, this is one I did before, but I felt it was important that it is, it is. you know at least you know I'm going to pretend I'm um, thinking is it Barack Obama or George Bush, but one of the elder statesmen, hmm. and uh, of course you know I'm not very good at doing um, voices. I will try. <laughs> so the first <laughs> thing. <laughs> So, the, so this is the state of the nation. Just don't do it this hard of Donald Trump. <laughs> yes, you know, you know, you know. Well, maybe I will try another time. I won't try for now. I'll just be me for now. So the first thing is that the awareness yeah, and recognition that change is needed has increased. I think that's firmly on the table. I'm not saying it wasn't always there, but right now it's much more enhanced because it's right there in people's faces. And whilst there is improvement um, um, in, in terms of the gender balance, I'm not talking about the financial gap or the pay gap, but just in terms of there are now more women in planning than when I started out in planning. At least it's comforting to be here and I can see Mary. Hi, Mary. Power to the women. <laughs> anyway, so gender... <laughs> So gender balance is improving, but we need to also reduce the gap and get more BAMEs on board. Um, what we are getting in the profession is BAMEs come through the front door and they are living through the back door. And yeah. that's because in most cases, they are not getting the promotion, they are not getting the support, um, the, you know, and there are studies that have shown that a BME is more likely, three times more likely to be disciplined, to go through a disciplinary process in the workplace than a non-BME, you know. So it's, it's really, really something that we need to address and start to think about how can we stop people leaving from the back, mm -hmm. you know. And so that's one of the first things. And the other thing is that in terms of diversity and inclusion, there is still a big gap in terms of physical disability within the profession. Mm. And again, maybe the nature of the work. You know, however, we should be able to, um, to, to attract more people with all forms of disability into the profession and find a way that everyone can feel included and that it's not just for a particular group. I'd like to also shout out to the Neurodiversity Network. They, they set out um, just shortly after we did. And of course, a bigger shout out to Women in Planning. Um, it's been 20 years since they started. And I'm also on the board for Women in Planning. So there's quite a lot going on in this space. And um, it's quite comforting to know that many organizations are willing to embrace change. And many organizations are, do uh, are adopting EDI strategies. And of course, one of the biggest changes is the RTPI. Mm. They've now got an EDI manager and they released their change strategy about two years ago. Same, you know, similar time to when the BIM Planners Network was formed. And um, last year, every region now has an EDI champion. And of course, we will, you know, as, as a network, we would like to, you know, acknowledge the fact that we've been heavily involved with the EDI manager. We meet with them regularly, monthly, 
and we've been able to influence to a great deal the publicity you see coming out of the RTPI. At times we've had to make a big noise and we've had to like scream and say, no, that's not, that, that's not right. And they've been very, very responsive and they've made those changes. And so we see the biggest planning institutes listening to the BAM Planners Network, listening to their members and making changes. And so if you were to ask me what the future looks like, the future is bright. And of course, I have to add this, the future is orange. <laughs> but the future is bright. So hopefully it will get brighter. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a really positive note. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to sort of make an observation about how it's a, it's a little odd, isn't it, that I think there's been one um, uh, BAME um, Secretary of State uh, for Communities, etc., or DLAC, like, as in now is, and Planning Minister, Alex Sharma. Uh, one out of, it's fair to say, there have been quite a few of them, haven't there, in, in, in the last few years? Five planning ministers this year. Uh, so it's a little bit odd, given that the C in DLUC is, is communities. Um, but I'm going to ask you my last question on a happier note, which is, of course, as we all know, the first BME Prime Minister was anointed PM on Diwali last month. He actually became PM the next day, but the, uh, the inevitability of it was confirmed on the Monday evening. How big a deal is it, uh, Helen, that, that Rishi has finally broken that glass ceiling? And what effect do you think it's likely to have? I would say it is a, it's a very big deal. Um, I've been waiting a long time to see the first BME Prime Minister. I don't think many of us thought it was going to happen so soon, but it, but it did. And so it's been, you know, it's something that we, we are all proud of. It's something, it's, you know, it's similar to when we were young, mm -hmm. became the first um, BME RCPI president. It was big. Because it gives it gives um, encouragement, it gives hope, it makes the younger ones to aspire to know that if they, you know, if they work hard, if they contribute the, to the, so you know, if they make contributions to the society, they can also get there. And um, you know, and you know, as I've um, said somewhere else, is the fact that when people see someone that is in a, in a much higher position, that it, you know, it gives them that courage to aspire. I've had many people walking up to me and saying, because I see you do this, I know I can do it. So th there's going to be changes in terms of younger people going to politics, younger people, you know, aspiring for bigger position, whether the society will change. And, you know, mm -hmm. because I know that the government says there is no racism. But that's not the experience. That's not the lived experience of many. That's mm -hmm. not the lived experience. I've been sworn at. I've seen someone being battered right in front of me. And the white guy raised the bat to hit me on the head. I stared at him and he walked away. And this was in the 1990s. 2020s, out on a side visit, some people in the car started calling names and everything drove past, came back, and all of that. It's still happening. And so whether that will change overnight, I doubt it. But what I know is that it's going to give up to a lot of BMEs. And hopefully, we will start to see a systematic change in people's behavior in terms of how they relate to people from other um, ethnic groups. Thank you, Helen. You mentioned Wei, uh, Wei Yang, the first BME president of the RCPI, who's on the show. I, I have a pretty good idea who might be the second. But um, on, on that note, I'm going to pass over to Mary and ask Mary um, for your um, uh, your question to Helen, please. Well, I, I think, Helen, I'm, I'm, um, it's delightful to have you on the show. And much yeah. of what you said is really encouraging, actually. Um, although that last passage was really quite distressing. Mm. Actually, I want to ask you to explain, please, what I believe to be one of the problems that the BAME community really suffers from, and that is affinity bias. And I think we're all guilty of affinity bias, but can you explain what affinity bias is and what steps we can all take, all of us, whether we're uh, white or members of the BAME community, to try and overcome it? Thank you. 
Okay. I think, um, you know, um, as human beings, we are all biased. Then there is no one that is immune from bias. And so affinity bias, more or less, is, um, it's, it's, you know, is that, you know, is, um, okay, it's a bias against someone who, or, you know, who, who is different from you. So the affinity is someone that you can relate to, someone that you can see something that attracts you to them. And so it's like when women meet, for instance, if there are many men in the room, we women would tend to make a beeline for one another because we understand each other's issues. We speak the same language. Similarly, men would gyrate towards men, you know, and they would like to keep companies with fellow men because they can be more laddish, you know, have their beard, talk about whatever men talk about. We, and so these are things that is in every single person. We tend to gyrate, we tend to favor those that look like us, speak like us, sound, lo- sound, it's sound human like nature. us. It's human nature. And But then when we are in a society that is as diverse as this, and there is a minority group, when, when that is cultivated time and time again, it then leads disproportionately to, to inequalities you know, in jobs, because then at interview, you tend to appoint people who like, who look like you, sound like you, you know, and, um, and you need to arrest it. And, you know, um, I've been in that situation. I was making an, uh, an appointment many years ago, I think in the early 20s. And this person walked into the interview and there was something, you know, that didn't quite sit with me about the person. It wasn't about their nature. It was just about the way they looked. And I was like, okay, calm down. This should not be about how they look. It should be more about what they know. What do they bring to the table? You know, and at times it's about we as individuals who are extroverts to be more accommodating of introverts. Because at times we meet an introvert and you ask them a question and they answer you with one, just one word. And then we are thinking that they are not intelligent. That's not true. That's not true. We need you're to so, give them so, opportunity. Yeah, you're so right. We need to embrace uh, diversity and not, yeah. not be af- afraid of it. Yeah. Um, I, I've got some other questions, but I, I should wait and let the others have a go first. Okay. Thanks, Thank Helen. You. Thanks, Thank Mary. Um, Paul, over to you. Sorry about that, Helen. I was trying to unmute myself uh, from all the background noises. Believe it or not, I'm right next to a wedding reception in the the room, which I think may result in a different room that I'm in sleeping in. So sorry if the, there's background noise. Um, so, so my question, really, Helen, is it's a common theme that we get on this show uh, about the the fact that the public sector is particularly under resourced at the moment, um, which inevitably means impacts upon morale, impacts upon performance. So how does how should the profession go about inspiring new new enthusiastic graduates to go into planning from non non orthodox backgrounds non conventional backgrounds rather than say the glitz and glamour of the influencing world or heaven forbid webcasting? I think that the first thing is um, most children from BME background tend to gyrate more towards the old fashioned um, professions like engineering law, medicine, and those kind of high paying jobs. And most people don't know about town planning. And so it's about looking at how best we can sell town planning to people from the BIM plan, uh, from the BIM background, letting them know that there, there is a future in it and letting, you know, and letting them know that it's a profitable place to be. You know, it's a, pro- it's a profitable profession, not just financially, but also in terms of your the, the value you add, the, your self-worth, the, the, the way that you feel about helping people. So there is so much in the profession, but that needs to be packaged and sold. If not, many people just see, like my daughter, all she sees is me working hard and she's thinking, mommy, I want to be a planner. And I'm saying, no, it's an interesting <laughs> profession. So we need to let people know that it's not just all hard grind, because that's what most people <clears throat> see is that planners work long hours. And in some cases, for little pay, it depends on which part of the country and sector that you are in. 
Thank you. Thank you for Helen and Paul. Sasha. Um, oh, it's, it's even daytime now in, in New Zealand, by the look of it. Yeah, yeah, it's Friday morning. And I've got the day to look forward to. Um, Helen, who who's your hero and why? Ah, oh, so many, so many people, so many people uh, come to my mind. Uh, but the first person I'll mention is my mom, and she's my hero because um, she raised. Um, so we are seven. Wow! And I'm the youngest of seven. She's an hero because she brought me up to be very independent. And that's because she was married to a man who was, um, who had, again, I know this is going public, but I don't <laughs> mind saying it. Ten women had children for him. He was an MP in the First Republic in Nigeria, tall and some man, but very many women and everything else. But she made sure that as the very first wife, after a while, she couldn't take it. She left. I was only three. I was three when my mom stole us. I would say stole because my dad refused to let us go. I remember being hidden on, you know, in a black cab in Nigeria. And my mom said, stay low. Don't put your head up until we leave. But she made sure she gave us the best education money she could afford, money could buy. And she raised us up to be well disciplined, principled. I can't just name it, but my mom, she's late. I lost her when I was in my mid-20s. She's gone. My dad died the year after. But my mom is my role model. Hardworking, dedicated, focused. She believed in the power of education and of kindness. Sounds like a very worthy hero Thank indeed. You. Um, and Chris, your question. I just say, Helen, I think your mom would be well and truly proud of you. That is absolutely for sure. Um, so my question is, uh, talking about the, the lack of career progression, which you've mentioned a couple of times, which is very important to, to, to your members and part of the reason for setting the network up. My experience is that many of the professionals that I've met in my career from African or Caribbean backgrounds are unfailingly polite, they're modest, and they're often deferential to those more senior to them. They don't seem to put themselves forward quite as much as others like us, probably, um, uh, the five of us here. So in your experience, do you think that's true? And, and how can that be addressed by those planners themselves and, and their line managers and their bosses? Yes, it's true, because it's a cultural factor. And that's why I talk about cultural fluency. And I know we don't have much time, so I won't go into all of that. And um, And it's not just um, 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 it's not just BME, it could be anyone who is also introvert. And so the first thing is to recognize that it's not everyone that has been brought up to, to talk about, you know, them themselves to beat their own drums. Uh, in Africa, you are taught to be modest. You are taught not to look your elders in the eye. You are taught to be humble. If you are in Africa, humility would get you promotions. If you are too brash, too upfront, forget it, you're out of the door. And so it's it's different from the UK in terms of if the louder you are, the more you can talk about your success, the more you climb up in the career. So what is required is for managers to recognize the value of that person's work, is to bring them out and to ensure that they help them, you know, um, you know, and you know, I was going to give an example, but no, no time. So important thing is celebrate the person, give them their due regard, and you know, and just you know, help them, send them on courses. I've been on an on assertiveness course when I came into this country. I had to go on that kind of course in order to be more assertive. So there are courses you can send them to to make them more assertive, and even just drawing the attention that they need to market themselves more. But as a manager, I would say that it's acknowledging them publicly. So don't just say thank you when you meet them one-on-one. -on -one. In meetings, talk about what they've achieved, and that will give them more inspiration and more courage. Helen, Absolutely. thank you. Thank you. And thank can you. I just say, Charlie, just just um, we know, Helen, that you've produced a documentary which is going to be shown um, at the RTPI 
um, event uh, that's going on at the moment. You're speaking tomorrow afternoon. Could you just tell us briefly about the video? We're going to help publicize it for you tomorrow. So the video uh, follows, um, uh, it's, a, um, it's about the government's Tomorrow's Planners program, which the Labour government put together 20 years ago. And we were able to catch up with four of the recipients and we then interview them and follow their journey. And that journey shows us what's broken about the system. And hopefully it gives us some ideas and some direction of how we can take things forward. And so the video um, from, from those who've seen it is um, inspirational, it's sad, it's reflective, it evokes different emotions. And I know that Mary, you've sat, you know, and you've watched it. Maybe you can just tell me how you feel about it after I, you watched I, I it. Did, I, did, I did watch it and, and it, it was very inspiring. And, and I mean, it was a program that was run between 202 and 207. Unfortunately, it ended, of course, just before 208. But I tell you what it it uh, taught me. It taught me that it needs to be run again and that actually what we need is for the legal, the planning, um, the RTPI and do that. We, we all need to come together to set up a program to get more BAME people in planning, whether it's as planning officers, uh, the legal side of, of things, surveying, wh whatever it may be. There's a, there's a whole raft of opportunities out there and we need um, we need to get out there and publicize it. So I recommend you watch the watch the um, recording documentary. documentary. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. And can I just say a lot of people have asked you a question. We could have been here for three hours. There's so much interest and enthusiasm. We will make sure um, Helen and can I just reassure those who've provided questions, even as there's even a speaking invitation um we'll we'll get those all assimilated and we'll get rob our producer to send them through to you so um, okay. i'm sure there'll be a, an opportunity for continued dialogue um helen thank you very much for an inspiration to us all and to our profession and thank you very uh, very very proud of and you thanks for having me it's a complete yes, pleasure i, really I, hope, appreciate I hope we can meet in person at some point too and enjoy the rest of your time in the world's finest city i will thank you very much good bye. evening bye. thank you bye-bye bye-bye thank you helen thank you.